Hi, my name is James. Welcome to King's Fine Woodworking. Today we're going to tackle a big project and I'm going to show you how to build a shed. This is a backyard shed or a garden shed uh, or a storage shed and it's a fantastic project. This particular one might be a little deceptive. It's actually really big. It's a 10 by 16 with 9 foot sidewalls, 12 feet of clearance on the inside and it's got a 7 foot door. Uh, but these principles apply to any shed you want to build all sizes build exactly the same way. The purpose of this shed building series is to give you an exact step-by-step -step tutorial so that you can build any size shed that you want. I'll be following the Uniform Building Code, the UBC uh, guidelines for building a shed, and just about every jurisdiction in the United States complies with these codes. My purpose is to make this tutorial easy enough to follow, even for someone who has no building experience. And the project is designed so that it can be done with a minimum number of tools. All you really need is a circular saw, a drill, a hammer, and some basic hand tools, and you can accomplish this project. So we picked up our materials and we were ready to head back to the site and get started. The most important aspect on building a shed like this is going to be the ground prep. If you don't have that done right, it's just going to give you problems forever. So that's what we're going to focus on here first. I'm basically building a shed at the very end of my property here, uh, up against my neighbor's property. That shed is my neighbor's, although it actually exists on our property line, but we're really good neighbors. So there's no fence there. It was never actually even built there. And uh, I'm laying ours out here to kind of see where exactly I'm going to place it. I think I want it to be lined up flush with the front of my workshop there, which is what that concrete base is. And when I do that, I kind of ran a string line to get a feel for where the shed is going to go. These are the skids that I'm going to put the shed on top of. And I took some measurements and took some measurements with the long level, and I realized that the property slopes away about six inches, and that's really just too steep, way too steep. So I've got to get this area cleaned up and leveled up in order to build a shed in this area. There are many ways to build a shed and to build a shed's foundation. I've done a number of them in my life and for me the best way by far is to build a shed on skids. The shed can actually be dragged around or towed around if need be and it's considered a portable building and in a lot of municipalities you don't even need a permit to have a shed that's sitting on skids. Uh, the key of course is to get your ground prep done first. We decided to remove the concrete to make it a little bit easier and I wanted to mention that we do have a complete set of 3D plans available for all of the popular shed sizes. It'll include a complete materials list, a cut list, all the angles, everything you need to build the shed from start to finish. And there's a link for those plans in the description below. So with that concrete out of the way we can take a look and make an assessment do some measurements and then determine how much fill that I need because I've got to bring that area near my neighbor's shed up in elevation a little bit because it's just too low. And unfortunately that tree stump right there is in the way too but we'll deal with that. A really long time ago we had a landscaping business and I used to own a bobcat and when we ultimately got out of that business we sold it to some friends of ours who also had a landscaping business and that's who I called to help us out here today with this project. Their company is called Alcatraz Landscaping, and if you need any landscaping work done, if you're in the Denver metro area, I'll put their name and number in the description below. They do fantastic work. And you can probably see the fill right there that we had ordered. What this is called is road base. The exact composition of road base probably varies in different parts of the country, uh, but here it's considered what's called a three-quarter minus, which means it's gravel, that starts at three quarters of an inch in diameter and goes down in size all the way down to sand. And it works fantastic because it's very inexpensive, uh, it's perfect to fill an area, and it compacts down very nicely, really tight, much better than soil uh, or anything else would. Now since they're friends of mine, they came over to help me with this project and to bring this uh, road base back, which is going to make it a little bit easier for us, but you certainly don't have to have a landscaping company or a bobcat to uh, handle this amount of road base. I think we ordered about 3 tons, which realistically is probably about 30 uh, or 40 wheelbarrows worth of, uh, worth of road base here, and it's something that you know a person could easily do in an afternoon if your, you know, your yard was uh, not sloped good enough for your project. 
And then of course we also got to make good use of his bobcat to pull this stump out. It's something we could have dug out, but it would have taken a long time and it just took a couple of minutes for the bobcat to do it. I want to take a moment to ask if you guys like our videos and the projects that we put out, if you'd take a moment to hit that like button and subscribe to our channel, that would help us out a lot. I usually don't ask for people to subscribe, uh, something I can never seem to remember to do when I'm editing videos, but uh, if you do that, it really helps the channel grow. Thank you. And now that he has that area kind of flattened out where the stump came from, uh, then he's going to bring in some more road base. And then what we, the first thing we have to do is to put down some timbers because the uh, road base has got to be elevated on that side and we don't want the road base to just be pushing against the fence that goes between our property line and I certainly don't want it pushing against my neighbor's shed. So I'm just going to use some landscape timbers here. And these are pretty easy to put in. Uh, you just we, These are six by six by eight foot long timbers. Typically we just drill a half inch hole in them and we just drive a two foot rebar spike down in them to kind of hold them securely in the ground at that location. I wanted to say thank you to all of our Patreon members who help support this channel. Uh, your support means a great deal to us. And if any of you out there are interested in supporting the channel, uh, there's a link to our Patreon page in the description below. And it's a great way to help us uh, create more videos. And a lot of our projects that we do actually come from recommendations or suggestions uh, from that group. And this is one of those. In fact, uh, we had the Patreon member ask about building a shed. And this is a project that we had planned for several months anyhow. I wasn't going to film it, but I thought I'd go ahead and film a detailed series to help them out. They're a big, a big Patreon supporter. And hopefully this can help other people out as well. And once we have the timbers all down and pinned in place where they go, we're going to send some 8-inch timber locks down in between the two of these to kind of hold them together at the joints. And we can bring in some more of the road base. And if you're wondering, this whole job with the Bobcat was about two hours. And without the Bobcat, it's about half a day. So it's really not a big project. We did take the time to use a straight 2x4 with a level on top to determine that to get this area level we needed to raise this side over here by about 5.5 inches and that's why we have a single timber over there to catch the road base. And you might be able to see off to the left there, uh, they're taking the time to level another section of it. And those two by two um, stakes, that's what the level has to come up to in order for everything to be level. So we ran two by fours between these in about say eight or 10 different locations and just made sure that they were all level. And so we're gonna fill this road base in up to about the tops of those everywhere and sort of screed it straight. You can see there we're taking a measurement from the timber over to that two by two and we're getting make sure you get the soil underneath it everywhere to kind of get it leveled out. Then once we have it approximately level, this is where the magic of the road base comes in. You can rent a plate compactor like this at most big box stores like Home Depots, Lowe's, things like that, and or even rental places. And it's about uh, I think we paid thirty dollars to rent it for four hours, and it's about a, maybe thirty minutes worth of work. But this plate compactor really compacts this road base down so it's not going to settle in the future when it gets wet. So we kind of uh, go through the steps to establish a level surface and then we compact everything down with this plate compactor and it's just rock solid. It's just about as good as having a concrete pad. Once that's all compacted we'll take the last little bit of road base and fill in the few areas, a few remaining areas that aren't quite up to level. And for us, that's right across the edge of the front part of the timber here. I mentioned there are many ways to establish a foundation for a shed like this. And this is one of the ways, of course, is to bring in some road base and bring an area up to level. Sometimes you can just rake the dirt or scrape the dirt around in your yard if you're only off by a couple of inches and establish a level area that way. Uh, another way is just uh, you may have a yard that's already perfectly level and you can lay your skids directly down on it. Of course, you can always pour a concrete pad and make that your level foundation. And some people will even put in concrete caissons. Whatever you choose to do in the end, all of them work. And I'm just kind of presenting you one option here. And I think it's probably one of the easiest. Okay, the ground prep part of the foundation is done and we're going to move to the wood. One thing that I'm going to do is I want the front of my shed to line up with the front edge of my workshop. And that's why we snapped that chalk line level with the front edge of the shop. 
The skids that I'm going to place the shed on are pressure treated timbers and they're four by six and I bought these also at the big box store. They're pretty readily available everywhere and you definitely have to get pressure treated because they are going to be in constant contact with the ground. My youngest daughter Sai is on the left and my daughter in the red shirt there, her name is Maya and her boyfriend Kyle are all helping us put this together. And so one thing they have to do first is measure from the outside to the outside of these two timbers and we want it to be exactly 10 feet wide. We're going to build the shed 10 feet wide so these need to be 10 feet wide and that's what they're establishing right now. Now Maya is going to verify that all of our hard work has paid off and that our structure is level. And I think they're, it's coming in pretty close there. Uh, the exception is uh, to the right here, what we ended up happening was the right skid was just a little bit higher in elevation than it should have been. So she's kind of marking the location around the perimeter of this skid so that we can scrape a little bit of this road base away from there. And even though the road base has been compacted, it's still pretty easy to scrape. You can just use a shovel and kind of just drag some out of the way. You could use a rake, it'd be a little bit harder with a rake at this point. But she's just using a, a shovel to scrape away some of the high zones. And then the back of a garden rake will kind of help flatten the area back out and get it ready now that the high spot has been removed. And you might find, uh, depending on your yard, you may have to do this two or three times uh, for you know maybe each of the skids in order to get them all perfectly level with what you want. And then what they're doing is just kind of dragging it back and forth. I think it was still ended up about maybe a quarter of an inch high. And so dragging it back and forth just kind of embeds it in a little bit deeper. And she'll go ahead and check this now. And it looks like this one is going to come in level. And it's important to check it on both ends. And we also checked longitudinally along the length of these skids as well to establish perfect. And now it's time to go ahead and cut the framework for the floor of the shed. This lumber will also have to be pressure treated. I did pick this lumber up from one of the big box stores and it has a reddish tone because this is redwood toned pressure treated lumber. And that's all they have in 2x4s and 2x6s and, and dimensional sizes like that. And so that's fine. We're not going to see it anyhow. So I'm not looking for any particular color because it's going to go on the bottom. But it does need to be pressure treated because it's so close to the ground and water and things will constantly splash on it. And we don't want this thing to rot out. And so my daughter Maya is going to go ahead and cut all of these to length for us and we'll take them over there to assemble. Okay, so they're going to carry over the two 16-footers first, the long axis of the shed. And these are going to be the rim joists. These are going to be one on either end, and all of the individual joists will go in between them. So we'll set these up and prepare these for marking. We've got to mark 16 inches on center all the way down for the framework. So Maya's going to mark these. It's important if you want to mark both of them at the same time that the ends are flush. That way the where you attach a joist on one side is exactly the same location as where you attach it on the other. She'll go through and she'll mark 16 inches on center all the way from one end to the other and then she'll come back with her speed square and transfer that line all the way across both joists in order to make sure that they're in the same location. And you might notice on the tape measure every so often one of those numbers it has a, is marked in red. So the 64 inches, the 80 inches, the 96 inches, and the red ones are basically all of the marks that you need to keep something 16 inches on center. That's why those numbers are highlighted in red. And now she's going back and just making sure that it's the same line on both of them. And of course the two ends are held perfectly flush. Next, we need to separate them out to each side. So one's going to go to the left and one's going to go to the right. And we're going to put the joists in between them. And we have our old shop dog there peeking out the doorway and trying to see what's going on.
So Sai and Kyle are going to carry these over and just kind of put them in place uh, approximately close to where they're going to go uh, on each of the lines. And then after we get them all in place, we'll take the time to nail them together. We're going to put these together with galvanized exterior nails and you could drive the nails by hand. We prefer to use a nail gun. It's a little bit quicker and our nail gun requires a couple of drops of oil each day or each day that it's in use in order to stay lubricated. Uh, some are oilless, some require it, but you should uh, check with whatever yours needs and, uh, and keep it maintained. All right, so then we're going to basically hold them up in place. One goes at the very end and we're going to tack them all together with uh, two to three nails per connection point here. And after the end joist, it's important that each of the subsequent ones are lined up so that they go right in the center of that line. That helps later when we're installing the plywood so we make sure we have a nailing surface at the joints. Now that that side's fully nailed, we will need to pull this out of the way because there's very little room on the other side since we're building right up to the property line. But we'll have to pull this all the way out of the way in order to get in there and access and nail the other rim joist on. This goes a lot quicker if you have two people. One person could do it, but you'd need to kind of prop some stuff up underneath it to make it nice and level. But if you got a couple people helping, it goes really fast. And if you happen to have a warp in that rim joist of the third person, which is what Maya is doing at the far end, they can raise it up and down as you proceed down the row, bring it up and down into level to make it easier to put together. It's easy for one person from a distance to pull the warp out. All right, now that that's done, they're going to go ahead and put this back into place and slide it forward to the very edge of our skid because the framework is exactly 10 by 16 and the skids are exactly 10 feet apart and 16 feet long. So we'll just check the edges of that to make sure it's lined up nicely. Then we have to take steps to secure the skids to the shed itself. Now this is how the shed ends up being one piece and how you can easily tow it around or drag it around by the skids. So to do that, we're going to bolt them together or screw them together, I suppose. We're going to use a six inch long timber lock bolt. We're using a half inch Forstner bit to countersink a small hole and then a small drill bit to get a pre-drill. And then we're going to just drill the... Uh, the timber lock bolts straight in through there. I'm going to have a link to all these things in the description in case you're looking to do any of this. And so we're just going to bolt this row down. We're bolting this corner first and then we're going to kind of establish a straight line and then we're going to go through and bolt everything. And once we're done, then you have a really firm solid foundational structure that's firmly attached to those skids. Okay, after the first corner is attached, before we can attach the second corner with bolts, we're going to need to establish that our framework is square. So the girls are going to do that by measuring from outside corner to outside corner on both sides. And in doing this, if we can get two numbers that are equal, we basically have established that our structure is square. Okay, that end's got to be squished, so size stand on that. So what they've come up with is this second corner is a little bit long. So size is going to stand on one side of it, and we're going to tap the other side in with a hammer, and we're going to take measurements until it's knocked into perfect square. Once we think we have perfect square, we will go ahead and measure again on both sides to verify. Okay, check the other side. What's that? 226 and 38. 226 and 38. Okay, so it's square. We can bolt that corner down now. Okay, so they've established square, and so we're getting ready to bolt that other corner down, but I do want to do one final check, and that's to make sure I actually have a straight line here. So I'm not going to let either of those two corners move. Well, the first one's bolted, so it won't. And we're going to hold the second one still. And if you can notice that, it's hard to see on camera, but the very middle of the rim joist is actually deflecting a little bit to the left. So we need to tap it out straight so it forms a straight line and is equivalent to that string line. That string line is a test to make sure that the edge of the shed is perfectly straight. 
Because this is a big structure and it's just nailed together, it's pretty easy for it to have a little curve or a warp in it. And this is just one final thing to make it absolutely perfect. Once that's done, we now know we have a perfectly square and straight structure. So we'll go ahead on this first side and we'll run our series of timber lock screws all the way down. I'm just going to go ahead and put one bolt, one of these screws, in every other bay. So remember, we're in a countersink with the Forstner bit first. That's important because that gets the head below level. We can't have the head bumping up because we've got to put plywood on this. But we're going to countersink first, then we're going to follow up with a pre drill. And then we're going to go ahead and bolt it in. And when you buy a box of these timber lock bolts, one box is all it takes for even a great big shed. But when you buy a box of these things, it comes with the driver for it, which will fit into your drill or impact driver. Once I've done that along the rim joist, I'm going to go ahead and put in another series of bolts in every other uh, joist itself. And I'll put it a few inches away from the edge, maybe three inches away from the edge of the joist. And this will just make sure that the edge of the joist is going to be forever locked to the rim. This just makes the structure all the more strong and all the more rack resistant should we ever decide to move this thing around. Now in order to help maintain perfect square as we go, I'm only going to do this one row right now with bolts. And we're going to go ahead and then sweep this off, get the dust and stuff out of the way. And then we're going to put on our first row of plywood. So we're not putting the middle bolts or the bolts on the far side yet. We're moving right to the plywood. So for the plywood, the best choice for a deck is 3 quarter inch pressure treated plywood. Here again, it's right next to the ground and water will splash on it, even possibly from underneath. And so we have to make sure that our plywood decking is in fact pressure treated. We're going to line it up perfectly to the corner and we're going to start driving some nails. We're going to use two inch ring shanked galvanized nails here. So I'm going to get a couple over near the corner and then I'm going to pull the sheet of plywood here back a little bit and get it perfectly flush with the edge and tack that in there. And then we're going to go ahead and nail everything down. And the rule for nailing, there's a nailing schedule and that's six inches. Every six inches you have to have one of these nails all the way around the perimeter of a sheet of plywood and then 12 inches apart in the field. So on the joists in between the areas that aren't the perimeter, we need to nail every 12 inches. You might be wondering about 2x4 joists and if that's strong enough. And in reality, it's really, really strong. If you consider the fact that the spanning distance between those skids down below is only around 51 inches, uh, they're actually, in having one every uh, 16 inches apart, it's actually really strong because it's a very, very short span. Even if you were to park uh, a lawn mowing tractor, like a, a ride-on lawnmower or something like that in here, it would easily hold the weight of several thousand pounds. So, But here again, if you do have to park something ridiculously heavy in there, you might want to go ahead and increase those to maybe 2x6, but for just about everybody, 2x4 would be plenty strong. You can see that Maya here has snapped some chalk lines to make locating those joists easier. And in the field, she's putting these every 12 inches. If you're concerned about not wanting chalk lines on your shed floor, then you can use blue chalk. Blue chalk is not a permanent chalk, and it's very easy to clean off. Uh, red chalk, on the other hand, is permanent, and so you might not want to use that. Now since we have carefully measured and put these joists right at 16 inches on center, you could see that we have a, uh, the joist is perfectly split in half with half containing a sheet of plywood from one side and half containing the sheet of plywood from the other side. If your joists are off a little bit, you won't have this happen to you and they're not going to nail together, the floor is not going to come together properly. And the very edge nails here that go on the seam, I tend to lean those just a little bit to make sure they go in and get a bite. So ideally you'd nail them about half inch to three quarters of an inch away from the seam and then angle them in towards that joist down below. And don't forget, this is a new sheet of plywood, so the nailing schedule is every six inches around the perimeter or the outer edge of this sheet of plywood. I wanted to let you know that if you're interested in building a project like this, uh, a shed, and actually of just about any size, we actually have sets of plans for sale for most popular sizes of sheds, and it's the exact plan. It's a 3D plan. It comes in PDF format. It's got a cut list, a materials list, 
all of the sizes are dimensioned out exactly the angles everything you need to build a shed exactly like this and you don't have to actually do any of the math or or calculations or figuring of it out it's all been pre-done for you and those are available in, uh, down below in the description I have a link to those all right, so they're going to run another set of chalk lines on this second piece of plywood. It's pretty easy to see where the nails went in on the rim joist there. And then on the other side, of course, we can see the joist itself. And then we'll follow up with our nailing here. Remember, the nailing schedule is 12 inches apart in the field and 6 inches apart around the perimeter. Now that we have that first row of plywood down and we've established that uh, our joists are nice and straight and our seam between the two pieces of plywood are meeting perfectly on a joist, it's time to go ahead and secure down the middle of these joists into the skid. We'll just use the same procedure here and we'll use the six inch timber locks and we're gonna put one in every other joist. I'd like to give a shout out to our woodworking community. It's called King's Fine Woodworking Community. It's on Facebook. And if you're interested in joining our woodworking community, you can do that. It's actually a closed private group. And it's a great place to share work that you've done with other woodworkers, uh, ask questions, get help on your work if need be. And uh, it's, it's basically just for woodworkers only, woodworkers helping other woodworkers. There's thousands of members who are there, people from beginners all the way to expert, and it's just a really valuable resource. So I'll leave a link to that in the description in case you're interested in checking that out. And here we go for the second row of plywood. We're going to nail this down, uh, get it lined up perfectly with the edge, and follow the same nailing schedule every six inches around the perimeter. Uh, of course, now this one edge of the plywood, it is the perimeter piece, but we can't really nail in every six inches here because you can only nail in once where every joist is, and that's normal. But wherever you can nail in six inches around the perimeter, that's what you should do. And we like to keep our nails going right down the center of those joists. So we're going to go ahead and mark with a chalk line again where they are. If you have a lot of experience nailing, you might be able to just eyeball that and hit it just right. But we're going to take the time to chalk line it. It only takes a couple of extra seconds. And then we know we have uh, our nails going right into the center of those joists for maximum strength. And if you've laid out everything perfectly up to this point, then of course this seam will split a joist perfectly as well. We'll tap it into place to get it nice and tight, and then we'll proceed with nailing it down. And once ready to nail the interior, we're going to snap chalk lines for this also. One thing to point out, if this were the floor of a home or a floor on top of joists that were suspended in the air, we wouldn't split the plywood in the same spot side by side. So we'd have overlapping. We wouldn't have them all split on one particular joist. In our case, it's not really a problem because our joists are actually securely bolted into the skids below. So our joists can't actually wiggle left to right and we don't necessarily need to alternate the seams where the plywood goes. Uh, but that depending on the style of construction you choose, you might need to do that. If you choose a skid system or you're going to set it directly on concrete, then that's not really a concern. And lastly, we, ha we need to rip one of these sheets of plywood right in half to cover the final two feet. Now, in ripping this piece of plywood in half, it was a four foot wide sheet. Uh, we lost the width of that full 48 inches by the, the kerf of the blade. So we lost about an eighth of an inch. Not really a big deal. We ripped it right in half. So that means this plywood's about a sixteenth of an inch short from getting perfectly to the edge of that side. But that's not a big deal at all. Sixteenth of an inch for the floor won't make any difference. Uh, one thing we do need to do is to tap this uh, skid over and get it flush in line. It might have moved a little bit on us when we were wiggling things around. And we're going to go ahead and bolt this down before we actually put that last piece of plywood on. I think it's best to wait to bolt this very last row until you have the first two rows of plywood on. That way you know the joists have been held straight and they're in the correct configuration when you do bolt this down. Because once it's bolted down we wouldn't be able to tweak anything if the plywood didn't line up exactly on the seam for example. We'll follow the same schedule here. We will go in, we'll put a screw in uh, either every bay or every other bay and we'll put one into every other stud coming back this way. And that'll be enough to securely hold this down.
And then we'll put this last row in place, follow the same procedure. We're going to nail it along the edges, get the seams nice and tight. And we'll go ahead and put the other piece in as well. Same nailing schedule applies, of course. And then we're going to go ahead and pull our chalk lines again, uh, just to make sure we keep our nice, perfectly straight rows. And finish up the nailing. And that's really all there is to it. So we have the foundation 100% complete. The floor is done. It's ready to go, ready to build the walls and the roof on it now. Uh, the first thing we did, of course, was to get the ground prep done and laid out our skids and then built our deck. And that will conclude this video. I hope you'll come back and see the remainder of the series and watch this shed come together. If you like this video, please make sure to click that subscribe button and you won't miss any videos in the series. Every video from this point is going to come out about every two to three days until the series is complete. And that's it for today. Thanks for watching.